The flying boat is an aircraft type that has all but disappeared. However, three different manufacturers in Japan, Canada, and Russia are still building them to this day. Designed for special utility and military applications, these large seaplanes may be the last of their kind. The commercial flying boat, however, is long gone, even though a few have been restored to all their glory. But as the flying boat sits on the edge of extinction, the float plane carries on the tradition. Just outside Seattle, Washington, the largest seaplane operator in the world has become a thriving professional airline. In the dry hills of eastern Spain, a brush fire has spread beyond the control of ground firefighting crews. The fire boss calls for help. If this one goes unabated, people's homes and lives will be destroyed. Only an aerial attack will stop the fire in time. And only one aircraft will fit the call. This is a CL215T amphibian flying boat. Built by the Canadian aircraft company Canadair, it represents one of the few flying boat designs still in production today. The CL215 model was originally designed for aerial water bombing, but its roles have expanded to utility transport and air-sea search and rescue. It is most valued, however, for its ability to scoop over 1,600 gallons of water into its specially designed water tanks. The tanks are filled by two hydraulically actuated scoops which extend aft of the main step. In less than a minute, the aircraft skims the water's surface and fills its water tanks to capacity. In areas where water sources are nearby, the CL215T is ideal for providing sustained water bombing to contain fires. Fortunately, the city of Valencia lies on Spain's Mediterranean coast. When a fire starts consuming the surrounding hillsides, the CL215T can fill its tanks off the nearby coast and reach the fire site within minutes. Before a drop is made, the four water tanks are fed with a chemical foam additive which acts as a gelling agent for deep saturation. The first CL215 model flew in 1967 and was powered by two Pratt & Whitney piston engines of 2100 horsepower. It was later retrofitted with two Pratt & Whitney turboprop engines and redesignated the CL215T. Spain received the first CL215T in 1991. The two turboprop engines deliver 2,380 horsepower and can reach a maximum speed of 235 miles per hour. In a typical firefighting mission, with a fire 100 miles away from base and the water source six miles away from the fire, the CL215T can make 25 water scoops and drop circuits before having to return to base to refuel. If the water to fire distance is less than 10 miles, the aircraft can deliver nearly 35,000 gallons of water within three hours. In all, over 140 CL215 models have been delivered to customers in Canada, Thailand, Venezuela, and most of Southern Europe. In most cases, these countries all have remote areas with very little infrastructure to accommodate a timely response from ground fire fighting crews. An aircraft that can repeatedly make high volume water drops is a precious item during the fire season. Continued demand has led to an improved version designated the CL415. In production since 1994, it has been delivered to Canada, France, and Italy. 
for an aircraft type that is practically extinct, the flying boat finds a small but significant triumph in the continued success of Canadair's water bomber. Perhaps an even greater triumph can be found 2,000 miles east of Spain. Off the Russian shores of the Black Sea, a very unique flying boat is making its impressive landing. This is the A-40 Albatross amphibian, product of the Beriev company in Taganrog, Russia. It is arguably the most advanced flying boat design in production. What many see is the progenitor of a new line of giant seaplanes. The twin turbojet Albatross is the successor to a long line of outstanding Russian flying boats built by the Beriev company. One of its most famous and highly successful aircraft was the MBR-2. This short-range reconnaissance flying boat first flew in 1931 and remained in production until 1942. Over 1,500 were built. The MBR-2 served extensively throughout World War II, and it is estimated that a few may have remained in service as late as 1970. In the 1950s, the Beriev company was at work adapting the turbojet engine to the flying boat. By the time the United States had given up on its jet-powered Seamaster in 1959, the Soviet Union had become a leader in the research and development of such aircraft. Soviet naval aviation continued to benefit from the advanced flying boat designs of Georgi Beriev, the Soviet Union's foremost designer of waterborne aircraft. And in 1961, the Western Bloc nations caught their first glimpse of the jet-powered BE-10 flying boat at an international air display. Although the BE-10 didn't serve in large numbers with the Soviet Navy, it was the successful forerunner to Beriev's A-40 Albatross. The Albatross first flew in December of 1986. It received full attention from Western nations in 1988, when the U.S. Director of Naval Intelligence mentioned its anti-submarine and mine-laying potential. Data had been provided by U.S. reconnaissance satellite photographs over Taganrog. Two of the original three A-40s built are used as flying test beds, while the third is for static testing. The slightly swept back wing spans just over 136 feet, and the aircraft's overall length stretches nearly 144 feet. The Albatross can cruise at 475 miles per hour and has a maximum range of over 2,500 miles with a full payload. Variants of the Albatross will include anti-submarine warfare, utility transport, and search and rescue. In 1992, the Russian Navy ordered 20 of the aircraft, and Beriev is currently pursuing the foreign market. The A-40 has established 128 world records. Once again, Beriev has taken the lead in advanced seaplane design. In the Albatross, the flying boat has found a new champion. October 1967, the prototype PSX flying boat waits at the edge of Osaka Bay outside Kobe, Japan. All control surfaces are tested. In particular, the flaps of the main wing are given special attention. Maximum flap deflection is 80 degrees. The slats of the main wing and tail plane extend automatically when the main wing flaps are deflected. This will increase lift and stability at low speeds. In 
It is with this intention that the PSX was designed. For although it is deceptively conventional in appearance, this Japanese flying boat has an excellent short takeoff and land, or stole, performance. It is also fitted with retractable beaching gear so that it can enter and exit the water under its own power. by Shin Meiwa Industries of Japan. The PSX was designed as an advanced anti-submarine flying boat for the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. Most remarkable to its design was the ability to touch down at speeds as low as 47 miles per hour and to take off over a distance of less than 900 feet to clear a 50-foot obstacle. Thirty years later, this flying boat design is still in production and service in Japan. Shin Meiwa Industries is the successor to the former Kawanishi Aircraft Company, the once respected manufacturer of many flying boats. It was here at the Konan plant that the famous World War II patrol bomber Emily was built. The Emily possessed an excellent hydrodynamic design with a performance equal or superior to any other flying boat in service during the war. The same designer of the Emily, Dr. Shizuo Kikuhara, led the development of the PSX. At the time, it was the largest airframe yet built in Japan. The wings spanned over 108 feet. It was just under 110 feet long and stood 32 feet high. A ray dome was installed in the nose for search capability. Elementary to the aircraft's design was the requirement to operate in high sea states. Such a capability demanded that the hull be designed to withstand the heavy poundings of such operations. The sleek hull had a length to beam ratio of 12 to 1, enabling the aircraft to cut through the waves rather than plow over the crests. A unique feature was the spray suppressant. Special bow grooves were carefully positioned to break the wave before it immersed the hull. This greatly helped to keep the engines and propellers well clear of spray that normally would have hampered the aircraft's performance. Flying boats have traditionally been susceptible to engine damage because of corrosive ocean spray. With the PSX, this was no longer a problem. Its short takeoff capability was attributed to high lift devices, and the low speed stability and control were aided by a special boundary layer control system. Special compressors blew air over the surface of the flaps, elevators, and rudder to prevent separation of the air at low speeds. The energy of the highly compressed air generated extremely high lift, thus reducing the tendency of the aircraft to stall. A very slow speed minimized the amount of pressure to the hull when landing on rough water. The excellent stall performance of the PSX promised to solve the many problems that had always plagued flying boats and had contributed to their decline. Takeoff and landing tests of the PSX were conducted in rough seas. On the day of the test, waves reached a height of 13 feet. The main objective in the development of the PSX was to master rough sea operation. As this test would prove, the aircraft was sufficiently able to maneuver in the open ocean. Shin Meiwa design was a howling success. 
production models designated the PS-1 were promptly ordered by March of 1969. By 1972, the first of 23 production PS-1 flying boats joined the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. The PS-1 was outfitted to carry a crew of 10. Primary duties included anti-submarine patrol in and around the Japanese islands. Search equipment included Jezebel acoustic search gear and 20 Sano buoys, Julie Echo ranging gear with 30 explosive charges, and four 330-pound anti-submarine bombs. The General Electric turboprop engines each generated 3,000 horsepower. By 1975, an amphibious version of the PS-1 designated the US-1 had appeared for search and rescue work. Much of the combat equipment was replaced with facilities for 20 seated survivors or 12 litters. The PS-1's outstanding rough sea handling design makes it ideal for air-sea rescue. It can operate in waves nearly 13 feet high in winds of up to 29 miles per hour. Both the PS-1 and US-1 flying boat still serve today in the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. A later version, the US-1A, was fitted with more powerful engines, and some have been converted into firefighters. This later model currently remains in production. Like the Beriev Company and Canadair, Shin Meiwa has managed to keep a dying breed of aircraft alive. While these large seaplanes require special care, they satisfy specific needs that the land plane cannot. Until that changes, the flying boat will continue to avoid extinction. The twilight years of the flying boat's career saw a rapid decline in both military and commercial applications. The 1950s and 60s were rife with last-ditch efforts to bring the flying boat up to speed with the great advances made in land planes. While military aviation found a few specialized areas in which the flying boat could fulfill certain requirements, commercial aviation was not so accommodating. Following World War II, the famous Short Sunderland remained quite active in Britain's Royal Air Force until 1958. But before official retirement, its noteworthy design would spawn a number of derivatives that would see commercial service throughout the British Commonwealth until 1974. The first Sunderlands converted for commercial use were called the Hythe class. But shortly after the war, the factory in Belfast began remodeling separate derivatives known as the Sandringham and the Solent. Both of these versions were remodeled with two decks able to accommodate up to 45 passengers. After most of the commercial aviation world had forsaken the flying boat, Great Britain still maintained that these large seaplanes were needed to ply the airways within its vast commonwealth of nations. Many of the remote areas were still without paved runways, and the post-war surplus of Sunderland aircraft could be put to good use. The British Overseas Airway Corporation received its first Sandringhams in 1947 and Solent's in 1948. The Solent differed from the Sandringham principally in its large curving dorsal extension to the tail fin, slightly wider hull, and larger Bristol Hercules engines. BOAC ended its flying boat service in 1950, and the last British-operated flying boats, those of Aquila Airways, flew in 1958. But Sandringham's and Solent's continued to serve among Australasian companies. Other customers had included airline companies in Norway and Argentina. The 
last flying boat service flown within the British Commonwealth was made by a Sandringham in 1974. Ansett Airways of Australia had operated the one Sandringham and a converted Sunderland between Sydney, Australia and Lord Howe Island. After an airstrip had finally been constructed on the island, Ansett flying boat services closed down. But Beachcomber, as the Sandringham was called, did not end its flying career altogether. Both of Ansett's flying boats were sold to Charlie Blair of Antilles Airboats in the Virgin Islands, West Indies. Beachcomber was renamed Southern Cross and retained the Ansett livery with Antilles Airboats markings. The Sunderland was refused a certificate of airworthiness because it was not technically a factory conversion. It was subsequently dry docked and used for spare parts. The Southern Cross was used for charter flights around the West Indies in conjunction with Blair's Grumman Goose amphibians. After Antilles airboats went out of business, the Southern Cross was permanently grounded and put on exhibit at the Hall of Aviation in Southampton, England. Ironically, the Sunderland, which had been grounded, is now flying today. This Sunderland frequently makes appearances at fly-in expositions around the United States and is privately owned by Kermit Weeks, an aviation enthusiast. This particular aircraft was built in 1944 at the Short Aircraft Factory in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and flew in British, Canadian, and finally Norwegian squadrons during World War II. The original Bristol Pegasus power plants were later replaced by Pratt & Whitney 1830 horsepower engines. After the war, it served in the Royal New Zealand Air Force before ending up with Ansett Airlines and eventually Antilles Airboats. The interior still retains its passenger accommodations as designed by Antilles Airboats. Able to seat 40 people, the aircraft also is furnished with a plush lounge and bar on the second deck including a galley for meals. Eventually, Kermit Weeks hopes to restore it to its original wartime configuration, including gun turrets, depth charge racks, and other military hardware. Weeks is currently building in Central Florida an aviation theme park facility that will exhibit several vintage aircraft, including his Sunderland. This is one large flying boat that has escaped the scrap heap. It survives as the final expression of a bygone era of commercial aviation. In the northwest corner of the United States, a commuter airline survives as the world's largest operation of its kind. And it's still growing for one simple reason. It operates off water. This is Kenmore Air Harbor, the largest seaplane operator in the world. It rests in the northeast corner of Lake Washington, about 20 minutes outside Seattle, Washington. Founded in 1946, Kenmore recently celebrated its 50th anniversary. In that 50 years, it has become world renowned for its success as a seaplane airline, which flies over 1 million miles annually a million miles over areas where operating off water is practically the only way to fly. Good afternoon, Kenmore Air Harbor. Okay, what day do you want to go there? The company offers both scheduled and chartered services to a number of destinations between Vancouver Island and the Canadian mainland. 
Its team has grown to over 70 employees. That's quite a change from Kenmore's humble beginnings in 1946, when it opened its doors with just one hangar and a lone two-seat Aronka K float plane. Today, Kenmore operates 19 various seaplanes, four of which can seat 10 passengers. 11 of the aircraft are of a type that proudly forms the backbone of the fleet. It is an old but trusted favorite among bush pilots, the de Havilland Beaver. Most of Kenmore's beavers are 40 years old, but Kenmore has upgraded them all and has become respected as an expert in beaver rebuilds. A reputation that President Bob Monroe never dreamed of back in 1946. We never planned five years ahead of time. We never thought, well, five years from now, we'll have a certain big hangar. We'll have a fleet of certain size airplanes. It's kind of always grew, and it's changed a lot. This what started out at the beginning, flight training, went into aircraft sales. After that, went to aircraft rebuilds. But we started rebuilding one Beaver, and it went pretty good, and somebody wanted to buy it. Well, let's try another one. Next thing you know, we were built right into the Beaver. But it wasn't really something that we started out. Let's, let's go into re restoring. Beavers, it just, uh, it, it just grew. In 1995, Kenmore carried over 50,000 passengers, two-thirds of which were on scheduled services. Its growth can be widely attributed to its experience in rebuilding de Havilland Beavers. Their modifications to the decades-old aircraft rapidly attracted the attention of several interested customers, including international buyers. Starting a small seaplane charter service went hand in hand with providing maintenance and service for privately owned aircraft. As the Beavers got older, owners found that Kenmore offered the skill, experience, and know-how to keep their aircraft in tip-top shape. The Kenmore repair shop looks like an aircraft graveyard. Various airframes and parts lie together, stacked in rows. Eventually, they will soon be resurrected. Kenmore has operated various aircraft types, but the de Havilland Beaver and its big brother, the Otter, were quickly recognized for their preferred durability and reliability. It's no mystery why Bill Peters and the Kenmore team worked so hard to locate, rebuild, and rejuvenate these venerable aircraft. De Havilland built a very strong airframe. They had they obviously had good engineers, and they were built for the uh, Canadian bush, which uh, was very demanding. And they also required, uh, uh, as a season change, they needed uh, something that could handle floats, wheels, and uh, skis. And that's what de Havilland uh, built for them. And a ship like this, uh, though it, uh, it looks like it would be ready for the scrapyard, uh, still the basic strength and, and quality is, is there after 40, 50 years. You're looking for parts that are missing, uh, sections that are missing, uh, because the parts are expensive. But as the years have gone on, you can't be as particular as we used to be uh, you know, back in 1970 with the uh, beavers. The, the ships have been out that much longer, and uh, uh, a lot of them have been, have been taken out of service, have been sitting, disassembled, and uh, have uh, taken a considerably more beating from weather and, uh, and other uh, physical forces. By the 1970s, used and retired aircraft had begun to fill the market. Kenmore first purchased several surplus beavers from the U.S. Army after the fall of Vietnam. Since then, it has found beavers in countries all around the world, including Austria, Canada, India, and Australia. It has rebuilt more than 125 beavers, and over one-third of the 1,631 built by de Havilland are equipped with modifications developed by Kenmore. The modifications include reducing the aircraft's weight, making for better passenger comfort, and improving the water rudder steering controls. The result is a superior float plane that is considered by most to be better than new. Kenmore was not always married to the float plane. 
Back in the 50s and early 60s, its charter air service was dominated by an old favorite of commercial aviation, the flying boat. In particular, a small amphibian called the CB. When I started here in 56, uh, they had more CBs here than any place in, in the world. The engine was, uh, had some uh, peculiarities and we had a mechanic that knew the engine inside out, uh, could keep it running. But uh, that company went out of business and uh, it slowly faded from the, uh, from the picture. The Republic CB had been an extremely popular amphibian among sportsmen. It had a good hull, but it had a lot of drawbacks too. But uh, we flew a lot of the CBs, and then, of course, at one time, I think we had 36 of them here at one time, private owners, they all had their CBs, all of it. That was a, fu a fun period, because they used them. They all get together, and they all get together, had breakfast flights and overnight flights. And, but that's a different era, that's gone now. The CB suffered the same fate as its larger predecessors. While it was perfectly suitable for day trips to some remote lake, it became unsuitable for a growing commercial airline. Even for an air service that operated only off water. Kenmore needed an aircraft that was cost effective, comfortable to passengers, and easy to operate. Compared to the flying boat, the float plane is a much more manageable and serviceable aircraft. For daily maintenance and storage, Kenmore much preferred the float plane to the larger, clumsier CB. With a forklift, moving this beaver is no problem. Very early on, we developed a, the fork truck extension so we could pick the aircraft up, move them at will all over the the, the property, uh, put them away at night, secure them. Uh, the uh, CB had to be rolled out of the water. You had to leave a, a uh, driveway for it to taxi to be uh, moved around the lot. The float plane could be picked up and set vertically into a spot. Uh, that's just from the ground handling. For water handling, the advantages were obvious. As chief pilot, Greg Monroe understands why his father, Bob, opted for the float plane over the flying boat. The CBs, or most flying boats, have that wing float that you have to get over the edge of a dock. And if no one's there to help you and so forth, it's a difficult thing, especially if there's wind blowing. With uh, the seaplanes being higher out of the water, just the floats in the water and so forth, they think it cut down a lot on the maintenance, on the corrosion and so forth. So that was one of the big advantages. The bigger flying boats, which is, you know, the time factor, you gotta probably anchor the plane or something if there's wind or current drifting around, have the boat bring your people back and forth, the luggage. It was just cleaner, neater, faster to be able to come right into a dock tie it up, one person do it by themselves, and uh, do all those things in, in a much shorter time. By the 1970s, Kenmore's charter air service had become so popular among fishermen that the company was ready for the next step in the evolution of its seaplane operation. We developed a clientele that came back year after year and it was in the late 70s um, that we kind of took a leap of faith and decided to try scheduled service. And um, I think that was a major um, turning point for, our, for the company because at that point we began selling the seats to twos and threes, people that wouldn't normally be able to afford the cost of chartering an entire aircraft to go fishing or to go to a boat. And we saw our market change from the fishing to the boating market. And where it used to be, as, as not that many years ago, maybe uh, five years ago, seven years ago, we used to carry 60% of our market were fishermen to the northern destinations. Today, that's kind of flip-flopped. And we're carrying 60% boaters and 40% fishermen. 
So it's, uh, we've seen a lot of different changes in the, in the market and how it's evolved for us. More and more people today want to visit the remote areas of the Northwest. Kenmore makes it possible. I think one of the main factors that has contributed to our growth is the fact that we could go to so many destinations in the Northwest that were only accessible by boat or plane. And uh, take it one step further, only by seaplane, because there just weren't any runways within miles, 100 miles of some of these places. The cost and expense of building runways is so prohibitive and nowadays too with the environmental concerns, the noise concerns and so forth, it's very difficult I think to get any kind of a permit to put in a runway. People found that this is a real convenient way for them to get up there to the resorts. There are a lot of them within about a two hour flight of Seattle to some of the most beautiful, spectacular scenery I think you'll find just about anywhere in the world. A lot of the little bays and so forth that we go into, they're just surrounded by mountains and no place a runway actually could feasibly be built. So it just really lended itself to the seaplane providing, you know, a real vital service to these areas. Julia. Yes. You ready? Sure. Okay. The two main destinations served all year round are the San Juan Islands and Victoria, the capital of British Columbia. During the summer season, Kenmore schedules four daily flights to these destinations. The growing market of tourists demands that certain flights accommodate more passengers than the beaver can hold. Enter the de Havilland Otter. Originally built for the commercial market, the rugged otter was quickly recognized for its ability to haul bulky loads into rough country. And it's big. It stretches 46 feet long, stands 16 feet high, and seats 10 people. Kenmore's four otters are powered by a Pratt & Whitney 750 horsepower turbine engine. The aircraft was originally built with a 600 horsepower WASP radio, but full power operation had been limited to a maximum of one minute. That's not very encouraging to a pilot trying to clear a swath of trees at the end of his takeoff run. With the Vazar Dash 3 turbine conversion kit, Kenmore was able to give the otter the power it needed to comfortably lift a gross weight of 8,000 pounds. Two of Kenmore's beavers are also powered by turbine engines. Compared to their blunt-nosed brothers, the turbine beavers can climb and fly faster. But performance aside, the turbine also offers a more long-term advantage over the piston beavers. It's getting real hard to find the spare parts. I guess crankshafts are real difficult to find now. And it could be a point not too distant future if no one's manufacturing where you just won't find those parts anymore. So that's another reason why the turbine engine has kind of become more popular or the planes have evolved into the turbine. It's just that there is a large availability of turbine parts and spares and so forth just because they're still in production and I'm sure will be for a long time. De Havilland built 60 of the turbine beavers, but Kenmore has upgraded the 1960s turbo technology into a more powerful engine. The result is a super turbine that can cut 45 minutes from a flight that takes four hours in a piston beaver. 
and its quieter engine and sleek appearance provides an added bonus. The turbine provides an, an extra element of um, amenities for the passengers in terms of speed and comfort and I think an acceptance um, in terms of reliability. So it probably the turbine beaver is something that we'll look to for the future but with only you know 60 of them ever made there just aren't that many that that are available. From the standpoint of cost and reliability finding a replacement for its beaver fleet may be Kenmore's greatest challenge. This setting is typical of the Pacific Northwest. It is no wonder that Kenmore Air Harbor has become inundated with tourists wishing to visit these areas. Or why pilots choose to fly with Kenmore. As they'll tell you, a seaplane pilot is one who likes to pick his own runway. A lot of the places that seaplanes go especially here in Alaska and so forth, it's more into the more remote areas. So it's probably an individual that enjoys the outdoors, enjoys nature, those kind of things, because that's where you're going with these. It's often said that flying seaplanes is the best of two worlds, flying and boating. And I think that really sums up a lot of what seaplane flying is about. A seaplane can take you anywhere, and a land plane can only take you to asphalt runways. Uh, you just decide you want to land and go into this little cove to a beach, you can land and you can go into that cove. If you want to fly low along a shoreline, you don't need to worry about um, this, the safety element of flying low over water without a runway underneath you. You have it underneath you in a float plane. And those are the kind of things that um, I think make float plane flying pretty special. Kenmore's pilots treasure the few pristine areas that are still untouched by man's hand. What draws Greg Monroe to this kind of flying is what drew his father, Bob, over 50 years ago. I love the solitude very, very much. Uh, the mountain flying I loved, going back up there. The Cascades used to be wide open to us. There were several up, little lakes up there we could go into, and up in the Canadian, and then, of course, over in the Olympics, but that's all been uh, regulated out of the country now. I mean, we can't, uh, can't use it. We can't go into those places now. They're all, but I used to enjoy that very, very much. A lot of satisfaction taking somebody and letting them off. And then I would really look forward to the return trip by myself. This kind of flying is a joy, but it is also a lot of work. Over the years, Kenmore has flown some rather rugged missions. For five years in the 1970s, beavers flew to the top of Mount Olympus in order to supply geological survey teams. The aircraft proved perfectly capable of landing on the snow. I remember riding up on several of those flights. You just come in and touch down. It's just so soft, you wouldn't even know where you're on. Just leave these big tracks in the snow. It was just a real thrill. Especially to be, to get out and think that you're standing on the top of Mount Olympus up there. And the view you had, you know, you could see over to Puget Sound, up to Victoria, out to the Pacific Ocean. It's literally, you know, you're on top of the world. Kenmore's sturdy beaver flew up to five trips a day to the 6,800 foot high snow dome. Those were fun flights, so good flights. And we were doing it for, for a purpose. They were in there, the survey people, you know, uh, measuring the water coming out of the glaciers. And so you felt that you were accomplishing something. It wasn't just, just for fun. And then the takeoff, that was, 
always a thrill of the whole flight, especially Mount Olympus, because uh, once you got the plane turned around, which often required two or three people out on a rope pulling on the tail to help get the plane around just because the water rudders weren't any good up in the snow. Pull it around, get it headed the right direction. And uh, on the snow dome on Mount Olympus, it was just a matter of going right over the edge of the snow dome. You're just looking s literally straight down at the valley below you. You're just holding on until the plane picked up airspeed and flew. You know, the tendency right away is to come back on the stick right away because I feel like the whole nose is just dropping forever. But then I realized that if I was going to have to build up airspeed if I was going to come off, so and then you had to release forward on the stick. But the whole, the first flight was just that when you hold that stick in your tummy, you know, to hold it. But it, it was quite a thrill. But once you do it once or twice, then it, then it became more routine. Not many pilots have used a glacier as a downhill runway. Not many have this job. Ken Moore's pilots are lucky, and they know it. How many people go to work and have an office with a window like that where the view is changing every minute and you know can spend four or six hours a day just looking at this beautiful changing view. I think it's tough to find that office. Flying off water has become increasingly popular. Ken Moore attracts students from around the world who want to acquire a seaplane rating. And those who have flown for Ken Moore invariably come back. We've had about 25 or more pilots that came through Kenmore and had flown for us for several seasons and then have gone on to the major airlines and are now captains or first officers and come back and want to come back every summer and fly for us. A number of these people do. So there's something there that, that pulls them back. And when, and when they come back, they tell us this is what flying is really all about. I think that seaplane flying is probably one of the last free forms of flying there is. And I hope it's around for a long time just because it's, it's so great to be able to go places where you can actually turn the radio off if you want to and just fly and just look out at the scenery and so forth. And if you want to turn right, you turn right. If you want to turn left, you turn left. If you want to land, you land. If there's a beautiful beach and you want to stop and have lunch, it's calm enough, why not? And I mean, it's great. The characteristic whine of the turbine otters and beavers is a reminder to always look to the future. While Kenmore captures the past in the romance and freedom of flying off water, it moves ahead with the advance of technology. And it leads the world in its seaplane operations. There have been so many inquiries that have come in um, from all over the world. Where Tourism is starting to grow and take a foothold in third world and developing countries, and there isn't the infrastructure there to support um, the land plane or, or um, the traffic. So they're asking about flow planes. We even had a we even had an inquiry from uh, the United Arab Emirates that have a, a several resorts um, out in the Gulf, and they want to fly seaplanes back and forth and it asked Kenmore to actually consider setting up a turnkey operation. So there's one area, that's one thing that I think um, we might see in the future, uh, at least in the next decade or so. 50 years and going strong, Kenmore Air Harbor survives as one of the last vanguards of water-based flying. 
Visit this professional seaplane airline and you'll find out what happened to the flying boat. Basically, it is still around. This is what Kenmore Air Harbor is all about. It's a different form of the flying boat, but the spirit, the essence, what it would do is still here. And I think that's what has contributed to our growth and has carried us to the point where we are today.